Hello, and welcome to the second episode of Movies, colon, they're pretty good. I'm your host, Travis Dudding, and thank you for everyone who's back uh, listening to the second episode. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Anyone that listened to the first one, it's a, just feels really nice. So thank you. Thank you for anyone that reached out to. All right. So today, if you couldn't tell from the title of the episode, when you hit play, we're talking about 2019's Midsommar or Midsummer. It's spelled Midsommar, but, you know, I think you just pronounce it Midsummer. Anyways, one of my favorite films, one of my top favorite all-time films. Uh, It's a recent one, I know, but... Just immediately fell in love with it, and now I've watched it six times, including the time for this episode, and it's still one of my favorite movies. All right, so getting into it right off the bat. Love that A24 logo. You pretty much know it's probably going to be pretty good, or at least like pretentious and artsy when you see that A24 logo. So either way, like you're getting... You're getting into something that's like, I don't know, you could like brag and feel cool about, I guess, when you see that A24 logo. Not always good. Now, as soon as I said, like, you know, it's going to be good that I thought of like a bunch of shitty movies that are made by A24. So, but we're not going to worry about that right now. All right. So when the actual movie starts, you get this beautiful folk art and it's all based on like actual Swedish folk art and it looks great and you get a little bit uh, get all these like little vignettes in the folk art that are all foreshadowing for stuff that's later to come so I really like that detail you know of course you're not going to notice that the very first time you watch it but you know on when you've seen it six times then you start to pick up on that stuff so then you get a nice like beautiful snowy white town uh, white because of the snow, not because of the people. I don't know who all lives there. Uh, then it's like all it's like completely quiet, and then you get the first jump scare, which is a phone re- ringing super loud, and so like ev- gets me every single time, even though I know it's coming. Um, we see our main character Danny, played by Florence Pugh, who is amazing in this, and she's leaving a voicemail for her sister. We see that she has gotten an email from her sister that's kind of cryptic as the voice as we're hearing the voicemail being left on her parents voicemail i think it's the house phone that's ringing um so she's leaving that like hey checking on her sister and then she also calls her sister and leaves another voicemail and you see the parents sleeping in bed uh, then you know they didn't wake up from the phone even though it was like the loudest phone ringing ever so then we get to see the computer screen with the message from her sister, and I wrote it. I made sure to write it down. It says, "I can't anymore. Everything's black. Mom and Dad are coming too. Goodbye." So, obviously, very cryptic. She's freaking out. She calls her boyfriend Christian, and like uh, Christian is completely like. We, first, we're just hearing his voice, and you could just tell that. He's, like, half-assing everything. Like, he just doesn't care. He's, like, pretending to care. Uh, Florence Pugh's, like, amazing actress because she's, like, you, like, we can see that she's just trying to hold it together. She's, like, trying not to cry. She's got tears in her eyes. And uh, and he's just, like, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah, mm mm-hmm. So, and he's just worried about her sister. And then he's, like, giving her shit, like, oh, you're just enabling your sister. She does this all the time. And that, like, saying that she just is doing it for attention. Then she's like, all right, yeah, like, whatever. Like, she kind of agrees with them after a while. And then it's like, I love you. And then they're like a very hesitant, I love you too, from Christian. So then we see her calling another friend. This friend we never get to see in the movie. Uh, Just some unknown female friend on the other side of the phone and we see her walking around the apartment talking to her um kind of like just talking about the situation with her sister 
complaining about Christian, kind of being weird about it. And then we see that she is taking Ativan, which is a antidepressant. And so we know from that that she already has her own mental issues that she's working through along with having to deal with whatever her sister's got going on. So then as she's talking to this unknown friend, she's getting another call. We hear the phone beep, incoming call, and then it's an unknown number. At this point, it cuts away, cuts to Christian, and he's with his college buddies. They're at some restaurant, and then, like, the one friend played by Will Poulter is just complaining, like, oh, like, you can't let her, like, like, she's always calling you. Like, she'll never leave you alone, and, like, why don't you just break up with her, like, and stuff like that. So just kind of being, like, very, like, typical toxic men stuff. Um like toxic friend group stuff hounds and I'm like you need to break up with her and stuff like that then he gets another call from her and then of course they're like oh my god I can't believe it's her again and then he answers that he goes to answer it immediately she is crying super hard and he's just like what's wrong what's wrong what's wrong at this point it cuts away from her and or it cuts away from them the phone conversation and we are seeing firemen pulling up to a house they're opening the garage door all the exhaust is coming out of the garage we see two cars running they're turning the cars off then we see hoses hooked up to the exhaust pipes of said cars then we're following the firemen through the house the house the hoses are going into the house up the stairs then you see hoses taped to the floor of the master bedroom with the edges of the door taped off so no air could escape the room so the exhaust has gone into the parents room that's where we see that they are dead because they are being put in the body bags and then it then the camera pans down the hallway and we see the sister with a hose taped directly to her own mouth and we see her eyes wide open She's dead, obviously. Like, her skin's, like, gray. Like, no color whatsoever. And then we see up on the computer the email that she sent, as well as, like, all the missed messages from Danny. Then it cuts to what I think is, like, a really well-done scene. Because we see Christian walking down the street towards camera. He's got this completely stunned, out-of-it look on his face. But the audio is Danny crying hysterically uh, for obvious reasons. And she is just putting on the most amazing performance. Like, I don't think anybody can cry on camera like Florence Pugh. Like, it, she was able to capture so well that feeling of loss. Like, if anyone has, like, lost a loved one or anything like that, like, you know what it's like, just that devastation. And she pulls it off, like... It makes me wonder what happened in her life, what happened in the director's life, like, because, man, uh, yeah, she's just so good. And, yeah, then it just you see them in the apartment. She's crying. He's trying to console her. And then it goes out the window. And you see the title, Midsommar, in the snow. And then cut to daylight, you know, completely changes. We see, I mean, we are to assume that some time has passed at this point. We see Danny in bed, uh, like sleeping in, apparently. Uh, but the crazy thing is there is a painting above her bed that it completely foreshadows the end of the movie. And without giving the ending away just yet by the way spoiler alert for the whole movie like hopefully you guys watch it beforehand i mean or if you listen to it then listen to this episode you are fine with it being spoiled but anyways not gonna spoil the ending yet but i'm just gonna tell you what's in this painting and then let your mind wander on what is to come later and it's a painting of a large brown bear with a little girl wearing a white dress and a crown blonde girl white dress crown that's it it has to do with the end anyways after that so then we're gathering from this scene that 
Danny is very depressed. She's not really getting out much. Uh, Christian's like, hey, I'm going to go to this party, like, and I'll be back later. And she's like, oh, like, you know, I want to go. And he's like, are you sure? And she's like, yeah, like, it, it'll be nice to get out. You know, so we gather that she hasn't been out too much since the death of her sister and her parents. So then we see her. She's like very spaced out at the party, kind of, you know, she's just there, but not really. She's like there physically, but not mentally. And then you kind of hear uh, like a muffled version of the conversation going on. And someone's asking like, oh, like you're going to Sweden. And Christian's like, yeah, we're all going. And Danny's like, the look on her face is like, what? Like, like she's never heard of Christian going on some trip to Sweden that is apparently leaving in two weeks. And you'd think if they're together that he might have told her, but obviously he didn't. So then then it cuts to them going in the, uh, going home in the Uber and it's like completely silent the whole way. You know, they're not really talking to each other. And then we get, uh, they're back to the apartment. We get a cool shot of, Danny by the door, but there's a mirror next to her, and we could see Christian sitting on the couch talking to her. So you get to see both of them, but it's just the one direct shot, you know. This cool camera work cuts off. Um so yeah, they're arguing, obviously. And she's like, like I said before, she's just like, hey, well, like I wish you would have told me, you know, that's kind of a big deal that you're going to Sweden and like I'm just now hearing about it and you're going in two weeks. And then he kind of, like, flips it on her in a way, like, just, like, another big, like, relationship red flag thing of, like, somehow turning it into her fault because, like, oh, well, you know, it's not exactly this, but, you know, if you read between the lines, it's, well, you're so depressed all the time, like, how could I tell you some BS like that? And then... Basically, like, you could tell that this is the – how their relationship was all the time because then she, it ends up with her apologizing, like, no, no, I was just being sensitive. I was just being this. I was just being that, you know. And then he's, like, basically invites her to Sweden and pretends, like, that was his idea the whole time. Like, well, like, I mean, I wanted you to go too, and I was going to surprise you with it. Yeah, we could see through that. So then it cuts to – the the guys they're all studying like by the way they're all in college i think a phd program in anthropology it seems like um because they're working on their thesis and stuff like that it could be masters i don't know yeah it could be for i don't know if it's a phd masters i know it says in the movie but you know i didn't write that part down but you got the one friend played by Will Poulter is like, he's very funny, but he's also a complete dick the whole time. And he's like annoying, but like, I don't know that it's, it's played for comedy. So sometimes it's funny and sometimes you're like, dude, shut up. But so it's them. They're all like hanging out together at one of the apartments and they're like, Oh, by the way, Danny's coming. And Oh, by the way, I invited her to Sweden, but don't worry. She's not going to go. I just needed to invite her, but she's going to say no. And they're like, okay. And then he's like, oh, and then you guys are all supposedly know that she's coming and are excited about it. And they're like, oh, okay. Like kind of awkward, but like playing along with it. Because obviously I think they're like, even though they're a bunch of douches, they're still like have some empathy, it seems like. (laughs) So for her situation. Yeah. So she comes in, there's like awkward silence in the room. Everyone's like, doesn't know how to act. Um, And then at some point when everyone kind of splits apart, she starts talking to the Swedish friend, Pele. And then he's saying like, oh, um, just like talking to her, like uh, he's like just having like normal conversation and then he says, by the way, I wanted to say, like, how sorry I am for your loss. And at this point, she's just like, oh, like, you know, she you could tell she isn't ready to talk about that with anybody. And then she's just like, no, like, and then she's like immediately tearing up. Her voice is getting all shaky. And she's like, oh, I, I got to like go to the bathroom real quick. And then she starts having a panic attack. But 
Like, obviously, that is a bad thing, but it also brings one of the coolest transitions of her walking into the bathroom. We see an overhead shot of her walking into the bathroom of the apartment, Turn and then it turns into an overhead shot of her walking into an airplane bathroom as she's having a panic attack again there in the bathroom. And I see her go back to her seat, so obviously... She's going through with the whole going to Sweden thing. The whole reason, by the way, that they are going to Sweden is obviously Pele is from there. And he has invited them to his family's village, which they're like in the middle of nowhere in Sweden, and to do a traditional midsummer celebration. You see that it's a four hour drive, so you get a lot of shots of them like, you know, it's like a medley of random conversations that they're all having throughout the drive and like various people sleeping at different times. Then you find, this is where you find out that Josh played by William Jackson Harper. You may know as Cheedy from the good place. You find out that he's doing his thesis on traditional midsummer traditions. Does that make sense? Traditional traditions. You know what I'm talking about. He's, that's what he's doing his thesis on. So that's the whole reason he's going. And then the rest are going just because they're his friends. You know, Paley's friends and just, hey, why not? It'd be cool. And he invited all of them. So that's why they're going. And then we get a cool, another cool camera shot. Like, man, there's so many in this. But you see the camera behind the car and then it kind of flips over the car to upside down towards the front of the car and you see it like the car coming towards the camera upside down but then they as they're going under a um banner saying like oh welcome to you know whatever town it is i forget and then it flips back over the other way and then you get to see it right side up so just the you know another cool fun shot and they arrive in this field full of flowers and everything and they're getting out and walking because they can't take a car the whole way. Mark, played by Will Poulter, he's uh, freaking out about the bugs and stuff. And like, oh, there's ticks and stuff like that. You know, typical stuff. Then they meet uh, one of Pele's friends. Uh, well, he says, my brother. But then you kind of find out later that they just all call each other brother, sister, and everything like that. Because... That, that they just are all one big family, like, in a way. Like, they all, like, raise each other and everything. Um, so you got his friend, his brother friend, Ingmar, comes and is like, oh, like, come meet my friends from London. And so you find out that, oh, Pele's bringing his American friends, Ingmar's bringing his British friends, you know, that comes into play later. Um, and he's like, oh, like, we just took these shrooms. Do you guys want some? And, you know, of course, you know, as she should be, because she's going through a lot right now, you don't really want to be taking hallucinogenics when you're depressed, anxious, any of that. But so she's hesitant to do it. And then but then gets convinced like, oh, yeah, let's, you know, I'll fine. I'll take it with you. So they all take the shrooms. And then it cuts to them all just like sitting zoned out in the field, like on a hill. And they're like looking and Mark asks what time it is. And someone says 9 p.m. And it's like completely blue sky. He's like, what? Like, that's impossible. The sky is blue. He's like, no, that's not right. And then he's like getting all nervous and then walks away. Um, And you see Danny, she looks down at her hand because she has her hand down on the grass and she looks down and it looks like the grass is growing through her hand. So obviously, like, that's a little like, whoa, like, what's going on? And then someone says, mentions that the trees are breathing and you can see it does look like, like, I don't know how they did it, but it just, it looks crazy. It looks trippy. So yeah, after, at a certain point, like, that becomes too much and Danny starts freaking out. She just runs away and or just starts walking away kind of quick. I'm just like, oh, no, like I got to get out of here. And because she can feel a panic attack coming on and she's just trying to get to somewhere safe. She's walking away. Then she walks near this group who's all laughing. And of course, because she's under the influence, she thinks that they're all laughing at her. And so that's making her more upset. Ingmar's like, hey, like, what's wrong? And 
She's like, they're all laughing at me. And she's like, no. And he's like trying to like reassure her. Like, no, they're, they, they, they've been laughing. Like, it's okay. And she's like, no, like, I got to get out of here. And then she runs into some shed. And as she turns the light on, then in the reflection, she sees her dead sister. And then, of course, that's like, nope, got to get out of there. And starts running out. And then she runs out into the trees. Then passes out in the in the forest. Then we get a dream of her. It's a dream of uh, her parents sitting on the couch with the sister. And then the sister looks directly into camera, like presumably directly into Danny's eyes. And then she wakes up. Then you find out that she's been passed out for like six hours. And then they're like, yeah, like we're just waiting. And she asks like, if it ever got dark and they're like, nah, like just for a little bit. And then it didn't last very long. So they hike the rest of the way to the village. Um, they come through this like crazy sun gateway doorway looks super cool like all like carved and painted um then they start you know they kind of get introduced to a couple of people around the village and then after a while then the ceremony starts and then we see the presumably the leader uh Siv is her name uh we find out later she starts talking first in Swedish and then she's like oh like you know I forgot that I have to translate for my for our non-Swedish visitors. And you find out that it's been 90 years since they have done their last great feast. So I think from what I understand, they do a midsummer celebration every year, but they have a, an extra special one every 90 years. And so some of those traditions come into play much later, but so I think they get, there's, some stuff that is an every year thing, but a lot of the major things are only every 90 years. But more on that stuff later. Just like a couple things around the village that are noted. You see a, a physically deformed, like facially deformed person. They're doing some kind of finger painting. They don't really explain that at the time. Uh, then you hear about a fire that like a like a fire pit in the middle and Pele says that that fire has been you know burning his whole life you know and presumably a lot longer I've noticed I'm saying presumably a lot so sorry for that but I'm probably going to keep doing it um so yeah they just constantly keep that fire burning at all times that's part of the tradition you see them all sitting for uh one of their meals and anytime you see them sitting for a meal whether it's like on the blankets or or at a table, it's always in the shape of an ancient rune. I don't know the meaning of each of these runes. I'm sure it has some some sort of foreshadowing or like inner meaning to the film, but I didn't do that research. Sorry about that. I'm sure someone out there did. But that's just something that you notice. It, every time they show an overhead shot, it's a different rune shape. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is also when we get the first glimpse that Christian is thinking about doing his thesis on these uh, traditions as well. Um, he's not telling Josh that, but you just kind of hear it in a conversation with Danny, I believe. Like, oh, like, yeah, this is pretty cool and stuff like that. He's just like really into it, it seems like. Um, then while well, there's a there's a bunch of people running in a line. Uh, like doing some kind of game and it's like kick the fool or so I don't know. It's some kind of like duck, duck, goose type thing where it's like a conga line slash duck, duck, goose basically. So like all these people come running in a line. Christian gets kicked by this redhead girl that you could tell I like, kind of just like eagle eye sought him out. Just like, Oh, that's, that's the guy. That's the one I like. And so that all throughout the movie she's going to be like kind of like watching him slash flirting with them in an ancient Swedish way of flirting. Um, but yeah, this is the first time we see her. So uh, she comes running by. Yeah. She comes running by Christian gets kicked. So he's like, Oh, you know, it's like, 
are, are we supposed to like join in? And then Pele's like, well, you're American. Just jam your way in there. I thought that was funny. So he gets up and runs. And then uh, this is where we see that Pele is the only one that remembered that it was Danny's birthday the day that they arrived. Christian, her boyfriend, completely forgot. You know, I mean, but are we surprised at this point? No. Oh, yeah. And then we also see, like, this bear in a cage. Another random thing, but, you know, that'll come back later. And next to that, there is the this long tapestry, I guess, because it's like a – it's on cloth, but it's a painting and everything. I don't know if it was woven or painted on there, but this has this long, like, this sequence of events of – a woman creating a love spell or love potion. I guess love spell because there's more than just the liquid aspect of it. And we see her, we see the woman watch, like seeing the boy, like with the hearts in her eyes, but he's like not paying attention. And so she goes home and we see her cutting her pubes off and baking those into a pie. And then we see her, dripping her period blood into a cup of beverage and saving that for later. And then she puts some rune under his bed and then he eats the hair pie, drinks the period juice, and then he's in love with her. So more on that later. Just by the way, that's the thing that you see. Now we get to see where they're staying while they're here and it's this beautiful room like just very bright and vibrant a lot of blue and yellow seem to be like the main colors very ikea this is also like i forget how it comes up but this is also where we find out that they view the life cycle in their village at in 18 year increments represented by the seasons so Zero to 18, you're in spring, the spring of your life, uh, 18 to 36, yeah, 18 to 36, that's the summer, that's when you go off uh, away from the village, like, kind of experience life outside, then you come back, that's your working years, and that's 36 Ooh, I forgot math. But the next 18 years that end somewhere, and then the next 18 years that end at 72 is the fall of your life. No, winter, winter. So that's like the end years. That's when you're like the elder. That's when you're like the leader um, of the village and stuff like that. Those are the elders. Those are the teachers. Those are the people that you look upon for guidance and everything like that. And then Danny asks an important question, what happens after 72? And Pele does the, 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 you know, knife across the neck motion. And she's like, haha, that's funny, you know, but also like just thinks it's a joke. Um, then she notices a bunch of pictures on one wall of uh, women with uh, these like flower crowns. And she's at, asking what that is. And Pele says, oh, those are the May Queens. And then, you know, so he's kind of explaining what the May Queen is, that they crown one every midsummer. And then some other woman comes in, another Swedish woman comes in. It's like, oh, and then in Swedish says that the the kids are all going to watch Austin Powers if you want to join them. I thought that was a funny detail that that just, I don't know, an interesting movie for all of them to be watching. Okay, so we've seen it, we've only seen it once in the movie so far, uh, but there's this breath thing that, like, this breath, this breathing thing that they do in the village, and they didn't really say the significance of it, but it is, like, a <gasps> type thing that they do. And so when Christian finally does get reminded by Pele that it is Danny's birthday, and he's like, oh, like, I got you a cake, like, I definitely didn't forget, but then he, like, you know, does admit that he's like, oh, yeah, I did forget, but it's just because of the time change and the jet lag and all that bullshit. And so he has a cake with a candle that, like, you know, um, like symbolically 
the candle will not stay lit. Like he can't like get it to light or anything like that. And he's like trying to light a candle for it. He finally does. So that's just kind of symbolic of their relationship status, like as wavering about to die flame. Um, and when she finally does blow out the candle, even though like she hasn't been around any of the people like to do this, like weird, this weird breath thing, uh, she does that. So that's kind of significant for later. If, yeah, I, anyone that hasn't watched the movie is like, what the fuck are you talking about? But if you have seen it, then it's like, oh, you know, that's cool. But if you haven't seen it, you're like, what the hell is this guy even talking about? So then it cuts to everyone going to bed. There's a baby crying. And then you see someone put scissors under the pillow in the crib. And Danny's like clocks that. It's like, oh, what's going on there? But not not enough. To, like, she's not concerned enough to, like, do anything about it or, like, try to, like, hey, what are you doing? Or ask questions. She's just like, oh, that's weird. And then goes to sleep. <laughs> but before she goes to sleep, Josh is asking, like, hey, what's going on tomorrow? And Pele says, uh, tomorrow is the Atastupin. And, like, Josh is like, oh, like a real one? And... Billy's so like, yeah. And then everyone else that doesn't know what that is, because they aren't already studying anthropology and traditions of uh, Scandinavian countries, doesn't know what it is. And they're like trying to get it out of him. And he's just got his eyes all big, like, oh, like it's crazy. And Danny's like, is it scary? But he's not saying anything. So, but that's what is on the table for tomorrow. So when it is time for that, we see these two old people coming out of this big yellow triangle temple and they're wearing gray. Everyone else, but like everyone else from the village is wearing like all white, like handmade, beautiful clothes and stuff like that. But these old, these two old people are wearing all gray. So it's like, okay, there's some significance to the fact that they're, dress differently obviously if you don't know what's going on uh they look very somber um and then they walk up to the table and they come and sit down and everyone's just like waiting for them to do something uh and then they start they start eating uh everyone starts eating um you find out at this point because there's a woman nearby uh, holding a baby, and then this is where you find out that the babies are raised by everybody in the village. It's like a joint effort. It's not just like, oh, you had the baby, like you're the parent, you know, like most societies are like that, but it's like a joint thing. Then uh, they start, uh, the old people stand up and start doing like a chant. Like everyone goes quiet, and then there's some kind of chant that they're doing. Um, then once that's over, and you could see you could see like a very somber look in their eyes, but you don't know what's going on. So you're just like, okay, like something's different about them, and that's all you notice. Uh, then they get they sit down back in their chairs, and then they get carried off in the chairs. So it's like a like a throne type deal, and then they get carried off. So then it cuts to they're in some like quarry looking area like it's like a dusty rocky area next to this big cliff and everyone's at the bottom of the cliff and it's panning across the crowd everyone's facing the cliff like they're at the bottom they're looking up and facing the cliff um it's panning the crowd you see the our, you know our main characters the americans and the and you see the Amar's British friends, and you see the all the people of the village. There's a guy with a mallet. There's a guy with like a horn and stuff like that. So that's it. And so it's panning across the crowd, and everyone's looking up at the cliff. And then you see that the uh, the old people are being carried up to the top of the cliff. So they're up there, um, and then everyone's down at the bottom watching. And at this point, it's like. I, I don't know if it's a fourth wall break or what, because there's like a young teen boy that looks directly into camera, almost as if to say, like, are you watching like to the audience? So it's it's very interesting because I don't know if it is like that's what it's meant to be. But that's how I perceive it. 
And so I think, like, given what's about to happen, it makes sense to me. But, so, you see that. He's looking in the camera. Then Siv, the leader, she's reading off this book of ancient texts. And then you see that it has the finger paints from the, the, the deformed guy that he was, like, painting on this book. And, like, um, Josh is asking Pele about it. He's like, oh, you, like, could I read that? And he's like, oh, you wouldn't be able to. Like, so it's like a interpretive thing that you find out. So she's reading that up at the top of the cliff. You got the old people. They're doing, like, a ceremony thing. They take a blade and they cut their hands. Like, they cut the palm of each hand. And then there's these flat stones with runes on them. And they take their bloody palms and, like, run them from the top down. And just, like, this big streak of hand blood goes down. So you're like, okay, what's going on there? So then everyone, then it goes quiet. Like, the the scripture's done. Everyone looks up. And then you see the... uh, the old woman so it's a man and woman i don't know if i said that before but if in case i did it man and woman the woman walks up to the edge of the cliff and she's standing there everyone's looking up at her we see like danny looking up and you could tell like the there is like a there's a definitely a tension going on especially the people that don't know what's going on like you could tell something is about to happen. I could tell something was about to happen the first time I saw it. Uh, my heart was pounding. And still, when I watch it in later watches, it still like gets my blood pumping every single time. So they're looking up, and then it looks like, because the old woman looks down, and it almost like making eye contact with Danny. So that's like, there's something there. And then you could tell like that she kind of feels it like, She's looking at me. Um, so she looks down. Then, after she looks down, she jumps off the cliff onto this big flat rock. And everyone, you know, it oh, it's crazy. And if that's not bad enough, just the fact that you're seeing this old woman jump off of a cliff, then you get the shot of her body bouncing off the rock in slow motion and her face is gone. Like it's just this big bloody hole with the face flapping off. And it like, ah, like there's no way that me explaining it could give it justice. Like you just have to see it because it's, it's insane. And it's like, ugh. It it makes me sick, but you you can't stop watching. Like it, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what it is about it, but because I've seen some gory stuff before, but there's just something different about this. Is something like Ari Aster, the director, like he he knows what he's doing because he, he gets some. I don't know. I I I just don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. It's it's gross, but you can't stop watching. Um, so yeah, obviously she's dead. Then like at this point, like the sound is like completely muffled. It's like kind of slow motion. You can see like just this look of shock, just this look of shock on Danny's face, like the, our, our main character's faces and everything. And then, you know, of course, like the, the sound is completely gone. Um, you see... While the sound is gone, or the sound is muffled, it's not gone. But you could see the British people like, no, 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 like yelling at the old man who is now at the edge of the cliff. Like, no, like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Like, what the fuck's going on, you know? Just like completely confused, scared, shocked, everything. Just scared, everything. And they're like yelling, like, don't do it, don't do it. And then the guy jumps, the old man. And, you know, same thing. He misses the rock and he falls in a different way he kind of falls like directly like feet first straight down and it's quiet for a sec until he pops up because he's still alive and his leg is completely broken like the foot is like all the way off it's just bone sticking there 
And then you see the guy with the mallet make eye contact with someone else. And then you're like, okay, now we get to see what the mallet was for. Oh. And at this point, it's hammer time, you know, as MC Hammer prophesied. It is currently hammer time because mallet guy with along with like four other people walk up to the broken leg dying old man like screaming in pain oh yeah so he's screaming in pain the entire village is screaming in pain so this is our first insight into that they not only share their families but they share their emotions so if one of them is screaming in pain they're all sharing that emotion they're all screaming in pain so all of the villagers are all screaming as this guy's screaming uh guy with the mallet walks up just crushes the old man's head and just like with the gory detailed realness of the last one we get a nice slow-mo shot of that head just being crushed with a giant mallet and that is also just like bone chilling Oof. and not only does the one guy do it then you find out that the other people went with them because they all take turns like Basically just like, well, we got to make sure he's dead. So we're each going to do it. Even though he's got like a completely like his head is just like an inch thick of like bloody mush at this point. And they're still like, well, we, you know, just to be safe, we're going to, you know, hit him a couple more times. No, like he's definitely dead at this point. But like, let's, you know, tenderize the head meat, I guess. Oof. Sound goes back to normal again you know, right for speed and everything. And the uh, British people are freaking out, yelling still, like, what the fuck is wrong with all you people? Like, and then Siv, the leader, is trying to explain to them that, like, this is this is their, like, way of life. Like, this is, this is just how we live. Like, it for us, this is a beautiful thing because we live to a certain point and we get to choose like we decide like hey like this is going to be the end when you hit 72 like that's it you know there's no wondering like are we going to like live to 80 are we going to do this are we going to die of cancer are we going to live in a nursing home are we going to die alone no like we do this together like with whoever else is 72 during the midsummer, then like we die together and it's in our own hands. So, and she's like saying like, for them, it was beautiful for me. When I get to that age, it's going to be beautiful and I'm happy to do it, but they just don't understand. Like, I don't understand. Like to me, it's crazy too, but like it is, it's eye opening because one, yeah, I, did research and this was like an ancient thing. I don't know if it still goes on, but it was definitely a tradition in Scandinavia at some point. But I don't know if it like if this still happens in like hidden parts or hidden communities or anything like that. So, uh, but while she's explaining it to them, then we get another shot of like of her making eye contact with Danny. So everyone's like always making eye contact with her. So it's like. Obviously, she's the main character, but other than that, other than, like, in-world, we find out that, like, there is something important about her because everyone's focusing on her. So they're walking back, and, uh, of course, you know, Danny's like, I just got to get out of here, and she walks off on her own and starts crying behind behind this wall and everything just, you know, because obviously, like, how could you not, like, have a mental breakdown after seeing that even if you didn't have your family die in a murder suicide like that would be that would mess you up but you know on top of that obviously you're gonna have a little bit of a mental breakdown but hey so at this point then they like uh 
Josh and Christian are back at the like dorm, I guess. And this is where like uh, Christian's like, oh man, that was crazy. Hey, by the way, I'm copying your thesis. And Josh is like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, why are you doing that? Like, you barely care about school. You're dumb as hell. Like, why are you telling me this now? And he's like, well, I'm going to do it. And Chris is just being hella annoying. Um, we cut to some later stuff of Josh is, like, trying to get, like, more of the details and everything um, uh, about what he can and can't talk about in his thesis. And Pele is telling him, like, like uh, it's going to be, like, too much, like, because you're uh, – jeopardizing the security of this community if you give away too many details and josh is like well then like i can like change the names and stuff and then they're like oh that's not going to work though because you know whatever so there's a whole argument about that danny's wanting to leave and so she's talking to pele about that and then he's like no no like you know you gotta stay like you know it's gonna be okay like you're gonna be okay um, then he's like saying like, oh, like I was, um, oh, she's all like, oh, why, why'd you invite us here? Like, this is too much. And he's like, I don't know. Like, I just want, like, this is beautiful to me. Like, I'm so proud of my village and of my community and my family. And I just wanted to share that with my friends. And he says, like, I was most excited for you to come. And so that's interesting, especially because, he really had, as far as we know, no control over her even being invited. It was all like Christian, as far as we know. Maybe there's some stuff that we don't see, you know? I don't think so, though, because I watched the three-hour director's cut and there was no scene. But, you know, maybe there was a five-hour cut where he does, like, say, like, hey, Christian, maybe you should invite Danny. But as far as I know, that didn't happen. So then he's, like, trying to console her and everything, and he's, like, tr- also trying to relate to her. He's, like, you know, I know how hard it is. Like, it's different, but, like, I I can relate because my parents died in a fire. And then she's, like, what? Like, no, like, why are you telling me this? You know, stuff like that. Um, but then she's, like, kind of starting to feel better, too, because it is, like, hey, like, at least this guy knows, like, loss you know, and kind of a little more understanding, even though, like, the way that they do stuff here is different, like, at least we have that thing to relate about, and then he's saying that how special it is for him to live in this type of community, because they all, like, he, because while, even though he felt that horrible loss, he didn't have to feel it alone, because he had everybody else, because the whole community is like a family, and he's like, I still felt held. And then he asked, do you feel held by Christian? And then she's like, oh, like, what are you talking about? Like, and all nervous that Christian might walk in. You know, he's not doing, he's just holding her hand, you know, not doing anything. But still, like, just like, oh, like, what are you doing? Are you making a move on me? And so Pele leaves. Christian comes in after a while. And, like, so he's, like, talking to Danny. And he's like... He's just being, like, so fake, too. Like, it's like a person that, like, doesn't understand emotion, like, trying to emulate the emotion that they think they should be using at that time. So he comes in, he's like, oh, man, that was that was really, really shocking. And you're just like, okay, dude, like, maybe be a little more believable than that. But, like... Because to him, it's just, like, interesting and research and whatever, but he's not feeling that, like, weight of those deaths, I guess. Like, maybe he's just desensitized for the internet. He is a millennial, so he's probably been on there with all the, like, pain Olympics and stuff like that. Um, So if you were watching the director's cut, there is a deleted scene that takes place at night. Like, not too much to note there, you know? It's just, like, an added thing. Another thing of, like, oh, no, we're going to see the scary ceremony where... But you find out this one, because it looks like they're going to sacrifice some... Or some little boy is going to, like, sacrifice himself to appease the gods or God. I forget if it's, like, a monotheist or polytheism, but either way, he's like, oh, like, I'm going to sacrifice myself. And they're about to throw him in the river... And then Danny's like tries to stop it, but then 
everyone in the village is like, no, like, don't do it. And then you find out that it was all just like some like rehearsed play thing that they do every time. So no real danger. But then there is like an art an extended argument of Danny and Christian, like her wanting to leave and everything like that. So she they go back to the they go back to their rooms. She uh, asks Josh for a sleeping pill and then, you know, he borrow or she borrows one. Uh, she goes to sleep, ends up having this nightmare of everybody leaving her and that they're like abandoning her. And then uh, Mark's like laughing in the backseat. So uh, as she like screams in the nightmare to like, hey, come back, then you get uh, a shot of her like screaming like with her mouth open. But as she opens her mouth, all the like exhaust, like car exhaust, like comes out and everything. So that's cool. That's all. Then, so she's still asleep, but then you see, uh, it is, it's still nighttime and you see the redhead get up out of her bed, go and then put a rune under Christian's bed. And then Josh clocks this and, but like, it looks like he's asleep, but it's just cause he has his eyes like so squinted that you can't tell that his eyes were open until he, like, blinks, you know? So it's like, oh, like, so he saw that, but, he, you know, he didn't, but no one else did. Uh, so the next morning, he's asking Pele about it, and he's like, oh, it was probably, oh, because he, he goes and grabs it from under Christian's bed, takes the Pele, he's like, what is this? And he's like, oh, it's a love rune. And he's like, oh, well, I saw the, I saw Maya, the redhead, put it under there. And then Pele's like, oh, well, she just became, like, she reached the age where like, I forget what they call it, but basically it's the age where she can have sex or can reproduce. So, and I guess like, this is where we find out that that's why she has her eyes set on Christian. Cause it's like, Oh, that's the one I want to have sex with. Oh, so then we hear, we see Connie and Simon. They're like, they got their bags packed. Well, we only see Connie She's the British one, that, by the way. I, forget, I don't know if I said their names earlier. Connie and Simon, they're the British friends that Ingmar brought. Connie has her bags packed. She's, like, carrying a big suitcase. she got the backpack, and she's like, I'm getting out of here. And then someone comes up to her and is like, oh, like, Simon left already. Like, there's only one extra seat in the truck. So he went first, and then so-and-so is going to come back, take you to the train station. And she's like, no, he wouldn't have just left me like that. Right. And he's like, well, like there's no time. Like, she's like, no, like he wouldn't do that. But the guy is just like insistent, like, well, but there's only one seat. Uh, so yeah, that's all a whole thing. Not too believable, but that's what they're saying is happening. So then it just goes back to like, everyone's doing their own thing. You see, like, oh, like, Danny's over here making pastries with uh, some of the women. Uh, Mark's out in the field, like, just walking around. Uh, yeah, Mark's just walking around. Um, Christian's, like, doing his thing. Uh, I think he's asking questions about uh, stuff he's got to write about. Same with Josh, but he's just in a different area. Then we hear a woman scream, and everybody notices it. Like, well the main characters notice it and like look around but that's it like they just hear the scream I'm not gonna hear anything about that until later so now they're all sitting down at for their meal and they all have pies except for christian and but someone like deliver hand delivers his so that's kind of interesting like what's up with that um you can also see that his drink is a darker shade than everybody else's it's kind of like a i'd say everyone has like a light orange drink like almost like an apple juice like an apple cider vinegar consistency um i don't think that's what they were drinking but that's just what that consistency reminded me of um but his is a little redder than like they're all waiting to eat like they usually do and but christian like oh yeah because uh Danny makes some remark about like Connie and Simon and that the fact that Simon left without her 
And he's like, oh, man, that's really messed up. And then she's like, oh, well, I think you would do that. And he's like, what? I want to do that. Like, And he gets all mad. And then he just starts eating because he's all frustrated. And he's eating the pie. And he's like, ah. Like, starts like, <coughs> and then pulls a hair out of his mouth. A, you know, little curly hair. And the bark's like, oh, is that a pube? So, presumably, uh, this is the next step in Maya's love spell. And also, that kind of answers why Christian's drink was a little redder than everybody else's, because of the little period blood mixer that's in there. So then it's night again, and we see Josh sneak out of bed. Um, you see, uh, like before they all went to sleep and Danny's asking for a sleeping pill, you could tell he's like got something on his mind, but he wants to get into this room where they have the sacred text and he wants to take a picture of it, but the elders won't let him. So his plan is to sneak out and do it when everyone's asleep. So he does, he gets up in the middle of the night, he sneaks out. So he's in there taking pictures and then, okay. I completely forgot to say something. So after Christian eats the pube pie, then some the girl that came and recruited people to watch Austin Powers with the kids, she comes up to Mark and says, like, hey, do you want to go over here with me? And he's like, oh, yeah. Like, you know, because he, you know, he's attracted to her. He's like, oh, yeah, like, finally, like, a hot Swedish girl wants to talk to me. Um, so he's all like, yeah, and, and leaves with her. But we haven't seen him. He's not there when they're going to bed. Anyways, back to Josh. So he's there taking pictures. Uh, and then we see a reflection in the window that somebody has come up behind him. And then he looks up and notices reflection too. He turns around and it's like, hey, like, what are you doing here? Like, and, but then he like looks closer. He's like, Mark, quit fucking around. And then gets bashed over the head by someone behind him. And so as he is laying on the ground or on the floor, bleeding out, someone walks up to him and we see a, we see somebody wearing only a shirt. I mean, there's no, no pants, no underwear. They're just straight up Donald Duck in it. And, but then we see the face and someone has, Mark's skin like as a mask and like I don't know what like the need for having your dong out for this is but that's, uh, it was out so got tongue tied there for a sec but bottom line is Josh gets attacked by some leather face Buffalo Bill Donald ducking it with his dong out guy. Anyways, so that's it. So he bleeds out. He's, he's dead. And then back to the next day. Uh, so next day, next meal, whatever, breakfast, lunch, they don't really say. Um, then they get approached saying, Danny and Christian get approached saying, hey, like this book is missing. Uh, please, if anyone found it. And then they also like corner them and say, hey, like, that was your friend. He's missing. Mark is missing. It's kind of suspicious that these two guys are missing, and so is the book and anything like that. Then Christian's all like, "Whoa! Like we don't associate with them, or like like, like he didn't just like fly from America with them. So he's just being a total like oblivious. Like, oh my God, they're not my friends. But you know, typical Christian stuff. So now it's time for like the the May Queen competition. So whatever, all the women have to drink this special tea that turns out to be drugs. They don't really specify what it is. It might have, it's, it seems to have the similar effect to the shrooms that they took earlier because it's a lot of like the plants breathing, the trees breathing and the, you know, grass growing through the feet and like it was with her hands. So they, they drink the tea and then they all gather around the maypole in a circle and then they start uh, playing the music. And then it's kind of like a last person standing dance competition. 
But since they're all drugged, then they like fall into each other. They get knocked over and stuff like that. So that's like the whole point, And that's how they crown the May Queen. So while Danny is doing this competition with the other women, Christian gets brought into Siv's house, the leader, and he's having a special meeting with her. And then she flat out asks him, says, hey, Maya wants to mate with you. Like you've been deemed an ideal mate. And he's just like, okay, like that's weird. But is also just, he's not saying no either. So, and so then it's just cutting back between that scene and the May Queen competition and his meeting and everything. Finally, he leaves the meeting. He's back at watching the competition. They're playing this, like, I really wish the song for the May Queen dance was on the soundtrack, but for some reason it's not. But it's really cool. Like, I, I really like that song. Um, so then Christian's sitting there watching the competition along with uh, the men and any of the women that have been eliminated from the competition already. And then this uh, Anna Ferris looking Swedish girl comes up to Christian and gives him the a special drink that turns out to also be drugged. And he's like, like, Oh, what's in it? And she's like, Oh, it has like special properties to make you like open to what's going to happen. And he drinks it. Like he pretends like he's like hesitant about it, but then he just ends up freaking it. Uh, so now it's down to like only a few girls left in the competition. And like Danny's kind of like getting tired, but like she's also like laughing a lot. And it's actually the happiest we've seen her in the entire movie so far. So that's like really exciting to see and really good to see. Again, you're like happy for her because like everything wrong going on in her life. And she finally has some happiness and she's laughing with the girls and then she, out of nowhere she starts speaking Swedish and you know previously she's ne never learned Swedish but she's just under under the influence of these drugs just starts speaking it fluently and while she's doing that and laughing the other girls knock into each other and fall and Danny gets crowned the May Queen so as she's like everyone's like crowding around her and cheering and putting a crown on her and everyone's like, yeah, like celebrating and everything. And as the crowd, as people are crowding around her, like the faces seem kind of distorted a little bit, but the crazy thing is like, while she's like walking through the crowd, she sees her mom walk past her and she even says like mom. And then, but then the, she disappears into the crowd again. And then also while celebrating Pele comes up and kisses her like full on kisses her. Uh, but, you know, Christian's nowhere around and also like he's about to do some other stuff. So it wouldn't matter anyway. Um, so they put her on this platform that she has to stand on while she gets carried around and she's got a balance on it. Uh, and then she gets taken to this uh, girl drawn carriage where she like gets in this carriage and then all the women just like get in the spot where a horse would be and just pull her along. Uh Oh, I missed something. So also when um, before that, they uh, take her to a dinner and where she's at the head seat. And uh, while Christian's there, he's like already freaking out from the special tea that he got. And then he tells the, the old man that he's sitting next to like, hey, like, like something's wrong. And the old man claps in his face. And everything gets blurry for Christian. And he's, like, freaking out even more. He's like, oh, why did you do that? And then the old man just laughs and turns away. Uh, so, yeah. Then after the dinner's over, Danny gets taken away in the carriage. And then as she's getting taken away, uh, Christian gets up and turns around. There's this uh, trail of flower petals that he's supposed to follow. And that leads him right to the sex room, apparently. So he gets in there. Some guy with, like, a face curtain uh, gives him a some, like, 
probably like another one of those like shroom teas, but this one he like breathes in and you know, now he's like freaking out even more as I, as pupils get all dilated and walks into the room. And then there's Maya laying on the floor in this like bed of flowers and these other women like in this like half circle around her, everyone's completely naked including Christian. He takes off his robe and then, so, but they're just like, they're like, with their arms around each other, like rocking back and forth, like it's the the Who's and Whoville at the end of the Grinch. So Christian's somewhat weirded out by this, but also because of the tea, he's just like, all right, well, I guess this is how it goes. And then just, you know, goes right into it. Then they, so then like as they're doing it, then they start, like all the women surrounding start singing. And like the one girl like kneels down and like is touching Christian's face and like singing directly to him, like making eye contact and everything. And he's just like, what, like, what the hell's going on? And then as so then it cuts away from that. And then we see uh, Danny's like finishing her like ceremony, like the May Queen has to go and like bury different things that they harvest so they got like they're burying the grains they're burying the meat and stuff like that and then they uh have to stand with a torch over it and uh sing a song uh do like a little incantation chant type thing uh, then it cuts back to the sex dungeon and you got it's getting close to the end and like as as she's moaning so is the crowd of women around because like I said before, it's a shared emotion thing. And then some older woman comes up and just starts like pushing on Christian's butt to like make sure everything's in deep enough, I guess. (laughs) But he's like, again, weirded out, but like, doesn't do anything. He just like, has like, Oh, like, and then just keeps going. And then, so they're just like, singing and moaning together and then everyone presumably comes together so and then as but as before that happens danny gets back and then she can kind of hear the noise but like you can't really tell what's going on and so she goes to investigate then the other girls that are with her try to stop her and say like she's not gonna like what she sees but she does go and investigate and then looks through the little keyhole and then sees that it's christian what he's doing so she runs away and as so she goes to the like the dorm room area with all the beds and she starts crying obviously as she's crying everyone is crowded around her and they're crying with her and then it's all like synced perfectly like they're all like crying at the exact time with the exact intensity and everything and like she like feels comfortable with them you can like tell even though she's like painfully sad like you could feel that she's knows how welcome she is and then it's just cutting back between like the moaning in the sex room and the crying in the dorm room um and then, like, when they finish, then uh, Maya's, like, rolling around, like, grabs her knees and rolls around. And she's like, I could feel the baby already. And Christian, then Christian, like, kind of snaps out of it. And he, like, stands up. And we see his bloody penis dangling there. And then he runs off out of the sex temple and is running around the area. He's, like, trying to keep himself covered. But he's, like, completely naked, just running around. And he finds this shed and, uh, but as he's running to the shed, he doesn't see it, but we see a leg sticking out of the ground and it's, you know, it it has black skin. So it's obviously Josh because he's the only black person in the entire movie as of now. So then we just see his leg sticking out of the garden. Like it's a lawn gnome. And then he goes into the shed and then we see a body strung up and then he gets closer to like see who it is. And it's Simon, but he's got these flowers in his eyes, like, like almost it's, it's hard to explain, but it's like, it's almost like his eye socket is blooming a flower. And then the way he's, he's like strung up 
like facing the ground, like he's horizontal or parallel with the ground and he's strung up, but his back is cut open and his lungs are out. And I don't know if it is Christian hallucinating or if this is actually what, like how he was strung up that he is still alive. Cause you see the lungs like breathing and then, but it doesn't stay on that too long because Christian turns around and then he gets bludgeoned over the head and gets knocked out. No, wait, no, he doesn't get bludgeoned over the head that someone comes and blows powder in, uh, in his face. And then he passes out. That's what it was. And then you see like the person like closes, close his eyes. So, then he wakes up and it's the Swedish Anna Ferris again. And she says, Hey, like you're awake, but you can't talk and you can't move. And like, but then like, is all like comforting about it. Like that's going to be like an okay thing to hear when you wake up. Uh, so we see everyone gathered around. He's like in this wheelchair thing. You get, Danny, she's like kind of out of it again, but she's like wearing this like full like flower outfit. Like it's basically like a dress where it's like it's all this big mound of flowers, her head, and then the crown of flowers. It's crazy. Like, and then Siv starts talking about the tradition of what's happening. And so you've Every night, this is where we find out that every 90 years, like what is so big about this, this great feast is that they have nine sacrifices, four new bloods, four old bloods, and one chosen by the queen. Now, the four new bloods are the people brought in from the people that left the village. So you got Pele and Ingmar brought in. Simon, Connie, Mark, and Josh. Those are the four new bloods. They're all dead at this point. So that though that takes care of the new bloods. And then so now we find out the real reason that all that these people, these foreigners, are brought to this festival. And the four old bloods from their village you got the two old people that died in the Atastupan at the cliff um so they were just hey it was their time anyway so that worked out that's two down and then they got two uh two volunteers from so that they there's always like if there's not enough old people die that year then two people got a volunteer and Ingmar is one of the volunteers and then oof who you like you mentioned by name in like a scene earlier, but that's about it. And then, so now Danny gets to choose between either Christian or somebody that they pull out of a, they like basically draw a name out of like a bingo thing. And there's like a little ball comes out with a rune on it. And then it's like, I forget, I forget the name, like Tobin or something like that. And so she has to choose between this person she doesn't know or Christian, who is her boyfriend, yes, who she did love, but has wronged her from the start, basically, and just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And so you don't hear her pick, but then you see Christian being wheeled uh, away and then he's sitting in the corner of this room where they're skinning a bear, the bear that we saw earlier in the cage. Um, then it's cutting between that, the bear being skinned, and you see uh, the bodies. But they're not like really the dead bodies. It's like the skin of the people that they killed, but like stuffed with straw. Like they're scarecrows, but it's just their skin. And it's like, it's super weird. It's super eerie because... They're like just these floppy skin sacks full of hay. And they all seem to be themed too. You got like, uh, you got Mark who has like been like the Joker and he's got this like jester hat on. So it's almost like they like, oh, like, like they have to fit, find people that fit these certain roles almost. And then, so then it cuts to, you see, Christian in the bear skin 
like if you didn't put it together that that's what was going to happen with him sitting in the corner paralyzed and them skinning a bear. So they put him in the suit and it's like his face and the mouth and then they wheel him into the temple. And so all of the sacrifices, the ones that are already dead and the ones that are going to die are all in the big yellow temple, the big triangle that you see earlier. And then they give Ulf and Ingmar uh, two different uh, liquids, like elixirs, something. And they say, Ulf, this is for you to feel no pain and Ingmar for you to feel no fear. And then they go in, they take, put torches to the hay and set fire inside the temple. So as the temple's burning... He, he uh, ever it's like this triumphant music as Ingmar is like screaming, dying of pain, and everyone else outside is screaming with them because it's the shared emotion thing. So they can hear him screaming, and everyone else is screaming too. Everyone's just like running around crazy, like they're on fire. And Danny's like throwing up, and like it seems like visibly upset. But then it's a, I forget what the term is, but it's like a layered shot of, you see her, it's uh, it's her face superimposed over the fire in the temple. So you see the temple burning to the ground and her face is superimposed over it. And her expression changes from like upset to a full on smile. Like you just see her, this is, the happiest like she's been in the entire movie, like even happier than when she was doing the May Queen thing. Just like, I don't know, just uh, this look of triumph and pure happiness. And then that's it. That's the credits right there. And like th- this movie is, is one of the craziest that I've ever seen. And I love, I love how much is set up like early on in the stuff, like, like the painting of the bear which obviously the bear is Christian and the blonde girl in the white dress with the flower crown is Danny. And it's showing you right there that like, that's hey that's how the movie's going to end. She's the May queen. He's the bear. And then, but you know, it's not like the bears on fire. So they don't give you everything in the beginning. And you get another, like a few other hints, like when they're at the restaurant and they're trying to convince Christian to break up with Danny and Mark says something about like, oh, like Mark says to about the waitress, he says, see, you could be getting that girl pregnant right now. And then Pele says, don't forget about the all the beautiful Swedish girls you're going to impregnate this summer. So that, you know, that joke at the time comes out to be just basically the whole reason that he's bringing Christian is for Maya to get pregnant because he's been sending pictures of them back home and you find out that Maya had picked him out specifically from a picture. Just overall, I love all the like psychological elements of it. I love the way it deals with grief. They, uh, he also touched on that a lot in hereditary, but, and I don't think it's fair to compare the two movies. They are both very different. I like Hereditary more as a scary movie. This one got marketed as a scary movie, but I didn't find it to be that scary. Like, obviously, it's very horrific what happens to the two old people, but it's not, I wouldn't call it a horror movie by any means. That being said, of the two movies, I, I love this one more just as a whole, as a movie. And I will continue to watch it over and over and over again. It hasn't gotten any worse. It just gets better every single time. I still feel sickened when I see them jump off the cliff. but And my heart beats hard every single time. But I just... I. Like I said, there's something about it. Like, I just want to keep watching. Just want to keep watching it over and over again. And I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I hope the audio quality was a lot better this time. And I'm sorry if it got a little rambly at the end. I just, this movie does something to me where I just 
I don't know what to say, but I just want to say how much I love it every single time. So if you guys have any suggestions of other movies you want to hear, you can reach out on the Instagram. That's uh, at movies. They're, they're pretty cool. You know, it's spelled out with the T-H-E-Y-R-E, but no apostrophe, obviously, because you can't put that in the username. Um, and yeah, that's about it. So yes, thank you for listening, and I hope you guys stick around for next week. And if you guys have, like like I said, if you have any suggestions of movies you want to hear or like segments you want to hear, anything like that, it's like if you have suggestions about how I should do the show, if I want to, if you know, if you want me to do questions or if you want to hear about more of the behind the scenes stuff or if you just want to keep hearing it the way it is, let me know, okay? Thank you. I hope you all have a great week and I'll see you again next week. Bye.